lessons learned there and they've applied yeah. them now. And so there, it definitely seems much more cohesive and that's been impressive. Um, what has impressed you about what you're seeing, especially from these young people who really have seemed to seize this moment? What I've seen be most beautiful about this time is kids have the ability to adjust and move and be like water. They're truly plotting, planning, strategizing, organizing, and mobilizing. The skateboard kids came in. Usually you would see in the 60s, black people look like men. We make public protests. We get our heads split open. Sympathetic whites and allies and people who truly believe in freedom, justice, and equality entered the stage. Now, not only are you beating black people, you're dragging off white people. Like, it, it, and it became a tapestry, a unified front to, uh, to give us our most basic civil rights and acknowledge our human rights. That tapestry is happening again, and it's happening in a bigger and better way. I was talking about those skateboard kids. I saw those kids first come in as defenders. When police were hacking with people with batons, they held up the skateboards to protect them. Most kids who skateboard, my kids skateboard, because most skateboard kids in, in South don't look like me, right? Um, but I saw the skateboard community literally come in and save protesters from beatings. And then they got really frisky and they started attacking back. And I was like, this is, although I don't, you know, I don't want violence in the streets because those kids deserve to grow to be adults without being soldiers against the state that their parents pay taxes to. It impressed me that the proletariat showed government that you work for us. And in this moment, we are exercising our, our right to, to make public to display of the evil that, ha that has happened. Um, it, it makes me proud that I live in a country that has long promised equality, um, rarely given it to people who look like me, people who don't look like me defending. You made an interesting note and observation about the skateboard crew. And I think anybody who's watching has noticed that it's not just black people who are out here protesting. No, it's this not. Is, it's a tapestry of people. It's a tapestry of people. The, the Amish. I mean, the Amish. Yeah, yeah. Wasn't that crazy? I didn't even to see? know the Amish saw the news. <laughs> I was thinking, who told them? <laughs> right? It was like, I didn't find out. <laughs> right? I, was, I, was, so, I was so impressed, though. I was, and I was so thankful. My heart was filled with joy. Yeah, so you're seeing all these different types of people that you never thought this issue would resonate um, with them. It kind of reminds me of your music. Your music is unapologetically pro-Black, unapologetically, yeah, right? Absolutely, but yet, absolutely. when you look at a Killer Mike fan, it's a cross multicultural section uh, of people. Yes. Why do you think your, your music is able to resonate that way despite the fact that you are also clearly talking to your people? Yeah, I'm, I'm proud to be me. I like me. I like black people. I'm, I, I, I'm not making no excuses. I'm not making no apologies coming in the door. I love us. I am in love with us. And because I love me, it has nothing to do or affect my love of others. I have a very good friendship with um, East Indian cousins, Raj and Neil. They own the store right next to Walters on what's happening. So if you're from Atlanta, you know about Walters. If you're a big guy from Atlanta, you know about, you know, the store right next door. These guys have always just been good to me. Raj went to India. He came back, brought my, met my wife incense, these beautiful little elephant characters. He's proud to be Indian. I've learned about being Indian from my Indian friend. When you're truly who you are, how could you be offended? How could you not love it or like it? Like, man, I'm a part of the original people on earth. I'm from the continent that birthed all humanity. I think when you wear that proudly and unapologetically and not from a place of needing someone to be below you, there's no reason for a people not to like me. You know, I like you. You know, I got plenty. I got plenty of heroes that don't look like me. There's a portrait of John Brown on my wall in my basement. I thought he's a, he's a hero. He doesn't have to look like me. You know what I mean? But but I, I refuse to act like people who look like me aren't great. I didn't say good. I didn't say good enough. I didn't say equal. I said, great. I'm from a great and mighty people. And if you can't accept that, then maybe I'm not for you. But I believe that because I am simply who I am, I believe that that gets accepted. Because you know what? I remember being on the tour bus and I'm on there with a bunch of Northeasterners because my, my of course, my rap partner's a white guy from Brooklyn. And um, we're on there and they're watching Swamp People and everybody's laughing. And I come up and stagger into the front and I look at it and I start smiling and I look at the room and say, I got more in common with them than any of y'all. And I just walk to the back now <laughs> because it's the truth. 
I'm a, I'm a Southern boy. My grandparents from Alabama and rural Georgia. I grew up more like people on those shows. So I think across, across cultural lines and across racial lines, people identify with me, but just because I'm your typical American guy. <laughs> you know what I'm, and I have some special things. Um, I'm not going to deny that I'm special. I, you know, I was a smart kid, went to Morehouse, had an understanding of some cool stuff. I, I, I married a beautiful woman. That helps, you know. But I think that ultimately what resonates with people is that I'm a regular guy. My, you know, one of my best friends in the world is a white guy from Brooklyn. So I think that people understand that I have the ability not to look past your race or ethnicity, not to look past who you are culturally, but to look at it and love it and learn from it without wanting to co-opt it or be it. What you're talking about um, in a very succinct and, and, and robust way is really allyship. And that's Absolutely. been a word that, yeah, you have a lot of, it sounds like you have a lot of really great allies that are, that are in your life. Now in this moment, I've gotten the question constantly. I assume you have too about how to be an ally. You know, what do I have to do, <laughs> right? I've had so many conversations with white people, like really good friends of mine, in the last yeah. two weeks, so I, all right, guys, uh, I appreciate your enthusiasm, but yeah, uh, but hold on, hold on, <laughs> hold on. A yeah, but um, I, but that, nevertheless, that being said, is that you know what would you say to somebody who wants to not only be an ally but be a good ally? If you want to be a good ally in this moment, white corporation, white person with the means, that's a that's a worthy allyship on a ground level. If you're just working hard every week. You don't know what to do. You're an electrician. You're a plumber. Grab one young man who doesn't look like you, a young woman, and teach them that trade. That's allyship. Allyship isn't just throwing the money. But if you got the big money, put it towards somewhere. But on a very real and basic level, my son had an accident um, with a man named Keith. I bought my son a car. My son Malik with a very pretty girl in the front seat rear ended this guy Keith. Uh, he calls me. I pull up to Keith and the police officer. I say, if he'll allow me to handle this privately, I just don't want to call my insurance company because, you know, I had just got in an accident. For, I drive fast. My son, uh, Keith, in good faith, gave me the opportunity to do that. And me and this man became friends. You know, I'm, I'm literally friends with this white man who told me about Atlanta pre-white flight and um, desegregation, who's taught me about fatherhood and the importance of presence in your child's life. That doesn't happen if we're not open for it to happen. So an allyship with white people doesn't have to be an organization to save in the world. But you do have to do what me and Keith did. You do have to, on blind faith, trust someone who doesn't look like you and allow that person to educate you. So an allyship is not just calling your black friend saying what I do. It's going to black organizations that might be local and saying what am I do. It's calling your friend and saying, what's the next thing you're doing? And I want to be an extra set of hands. Doesn't mean you get to go to the black people meeting, but it does mean if they say I'm going to feed people on Skid Row, you show up and you show up with empathy and care and you do it. And I'm going to tell you, we need doctors in that space. We need lawyers in that space. We need legislators in that space. You know, we need the people who are really empowered to be in that space because there's some things that need to happen on ground level that once the grassroots people have gotten it here, there needs to be money put behind these things. A lot of the problems that we have now that are erupting could have been solved in 96, 2006, 2016, and all these other years, but we chose not to because we trusted the right thing's going to happen. The right thing's not going to happen unless we make it. And after that, you have the potential to truly be brothers and sisters. You have the truly the potential to be past the, the, the letting cultural, national, religious markers evict the fact that I know that I'm talking and I'm with a human being and that our very core past any physical difference. My job is to honor the soul of that other human being. So there's no need to have allies because I'm not at war. I truly have a brother and sister. There's no need to have an ally because there's no threat of war. I refuse to send any 18 year old boy or girl off to die. And that has to be something that's much, much deeper than policy, much, much deeper than the human condition in the last 500 years. We have to get back to that. So that's my humble opinion. I don't know, you know, where that takes white America, um, but I hope <laughs> you stay standing up fighting together. You know, Mike, we've been having this great conversation and a lot of people watching, they probably want to know, because uh, again, these things happen in flashes where one minute we're talking about this, everybody's fired up, everybody's willing to do yeah. things. And then the next minute, the momentum dies. So how can the people yeah. who are watching now, how can they keep this conversation with action, this momentum going? Take this conversation, get eight to 10 people 
around you, your neighbors and people who live within 10 square miles and start to see what you can do to affect and then connect with other people that may be in closer proximity, um, 30, 40, 50 miles, even another city or, or places that are doing it right, uh, that are doing it right in other places, connect with those people. And just, you know, if all of us do a little bit, no one has to do a lot. If mm. all of us do a little, if all of us pick a little to do, no one will have to do a lot. Mm, that's a word right there. If we all do a little bit, nobody has to do a lot. Nobody has to do a lot, um, absolutely. Nobody has to do a lot. Mike, I have enjoyed this conversation. Like I enjoy every conversation with you. I can certainly you know, talk to you. Yes, it, it is mutual. The mutual respect and love of society right here. Um, thank you. And more importantly, um, you know, thank you for everything you do on the ground. I mean, so many people, I mean, I knew um, that you tell the truth the way it needs to be told, but a lot of people during this time of crisis have been exposed to you and understand that, I mean, you really are, for the people um this is called we the people this is this is you all day long so thank you for all the work and all the inspiration all the words everything that you're adding to this conversation and more importantly to this action uh with that said we have to say goodbye but we don't have to get out of here just yet because i'm gonna tie i'm gonna toss this on to my brother van who can take it from here Jamel and I, we spent the past hour, we've been talking to Killer Mike, we've been talking to Elaine Welterau. We also got a chance to see that amazing uh, video from uh, Lil Baby. Jamel, what did you get from your conversation uh, with Killer Mike? And, and, and more importantly to me, what do you make of this moment that we're in? The one thing you can always expect from Killer Mike is blunt honesty. I think that's why a lot of people look at him as a really credible voice right now. Um, he's yeah. honest about what he knows and honest about what he doesn't know. So. I think when you have those elements, you, that's going to always make for a pretty good conversation. I'm with you. I mean, this moment at the same time is welcome. Um, it, it's also a little bit surreal in terms of what took us so long to get here to make sure that we're not always starting from ground zero every time we have to have a significant conversation about race in this country. Why do you think it's different this time? Because I mean, there have been videos before, and yet people still now act like they're shocked. Help me understand what what's different this time from your point of view. What's your theory? It's two things that I think stood out about the George Floyd video. One, there was no yeah but. And granted, in my mind, we've seen videos where there was no yeah but, but people nevertheless invented a yeah but. But in this one, there really wasn't one, even if you were Stretch Armstrong trying to stretch and find one, there just wasn't one. What always has just stuck with me is the look on this officer's face as he was kneeling on George Floyd's neck. It was so cold. It was as if this were Thursday. And he showed such a little emotion, remorse, any emotion you want to name. He didn't show any of that as he killed a man in the middle of the street with bystanders looking on. So I think that situation coupled with the fact we had already been reeling from Ahmaud Arbery, we had already been reeling from Breonna Taylor. Um, And even though the situation wasn't fatal, there was definitely a storm of of frustration at what happened with Christian Cooper. So this all together leads us to this moment where finally even the most adamant naysayers who wanted to pretend as if this wasn't a structural problem, what could they say? We, I mean, there was yeah. nothing else that could be said. And, and I think everybody who was already fed up decided now is the moment, now is the time. The world has slowed down because of COVID-19. If we are going to address this, this needs to happen now. I've never seen 20, 30 million white people asking black people for leadership. That's interesting because they like, well, what do you want me to do? I'm like, well, do, I don't know. Google is a powerful tool. I don't know. I'm realizing now, though, that this is an honest question. How do you think that we as African-Americans and our allies can rise to meet a moment like this and actually uh, uh, accept the fact that we may actually have a couple million new allies and how do we deal with that? That's new for us. I'm glad you use the word leadership because there's a difference between us being put in a leadership position and us being put in an educational position. The educational part, we are long past, right? (laughs) We we don't want to be educating anybody else about race. We're not here to soothe you. We're not here to make you feel better. But leadership is something different. And it looks different depending on how you want us to take that leadership. Certainly, we are accustomed to being a voice on these issues. We're accustomed to setting the agenda. 
Um, it's fine if we continue to lead in that direction. I think what we're looking for is if this were, um, you know, a relay race, we want to pass the baton and we want you to be able to say, okay, here's what we've been feeling about this issue. Here's what needs to happen to change it. The other part of this race is that you got to be willing to run it just as hard and as fast as we are, because if you're not, that's why we remain stuck in the flying pattern that we've been in for hundreds of years and decades as we've tried to, to reconcile this issue. So um, we have to figure out where what is the most useful way of allyship. We see a lot of people throwing statements around. We see a lot of people throwing money around. Um, we need that to be a focused effort and more importantly, uh, to be vocal about it. Um, I can't. I can't take any more double-sidedness. There can be no no more other siderisms, if I'm if I may make up a word, meaning that you give over here and you're a company that is like, yeah, Black Lives Matter, except for in my boardroom, where they don't, or except for in my organizational chart, where they don't. So I I, I I'm done with that, right? <laughs> That's great. Charity's great. Charity doesn't change structural racism, right? What changes it is when you actively look in your building and ask why mm. aren't there more black people in this building in this boardroom in this c-suite so the allies that we have what you can do change the structure and cultures of your companies of your businesses of wherever it is you have influence start there the thing i try to tell people is you know it puts, it puts us in a no-win situation i want our white sisters and brothers to be better educated and to to care more but i don't want to have to bear the burden of trying to teach and educate all the time the reason you pay tuition is because it's costly to educate someone. You coming up to me and saying, educate me, educate me, that's costly to me emotionally and, and from a time point of view. Also, I think we have to be very honest. Nobody would go up to somebody and say, teach me Russian in five minutes. And by the way, make me feel good about it. But I mean, you, you wait, hold on a second. Like, you want me to teach you about racism, which is the history of race in America is just as complicated as Russian. <laughs> And you want me to teach you that in five minutes. And also, if I make you feel bad about it in any way, now I got to be your therapist too. And like you said, soothe you or whatever. That's got to stop. I would love for somebody to come to me and say, I made my whole family watch the 13th and read the new Jim Crow and read White Fragility. And we had a question on page 52. Now, hey, <laughs> we can have that conversation all day long because you're doing your homework, but don't flop on me like you never heard of Google. If you wanted to know about cryptocurrencies or whatever, you find that stuff out before any black person ever heard of it. So I'm sure you can educate yourself about anything you want to know. I have to say something to you because I've never gotten a chance to talk to you. I feel like I know you because I'm such a big, you know, mad, crazy Stan and fan. Um, but I love you to death. I just am so proud of you. I'm so I'm, I'm saying proud of you almost as Patrick. I, I am so proud that you exist. Where do you find the strength? to continue to do what you're doing and say what you're saying, even in the face of opposition, to the point where now the whole world has to listen to you. Where did you find the strength when they weren't listening? You know, I, I guess um, maybe this is just part of the uh, the Black woman's condition is that we don't know any other way. And um, most of us, I come from a line of Black women who were just like this. My mother's like this. My grandmother was like this, where it's the old phrase, we've all used as Black people, making a way out of no way. Um, and scream until they hear you, you know what I'm saying? Is that I, because the opposite, um, to do the opposite of that it is what? Is that I, I can't even afford to do that. I don't know any other mode but to, to fight for what's right, but to try to stand on the right side of history, but to speak for people um, who don't have a voice or a platform as large as mine because somebody did it for me. What advice do you have for people? Uh, who want to have these conversations, maybe not as well-spoken, not as well-read uh, as you might be, but who really are sincere and want to have a conversation. I think you have to start from a point of honesty and being real about what some of your beliefs, prejudice, biases are, where they come from, why you learn them. I think if you take anything else beyond race, um, as we get older, we do a whole lot of unlearning, uh, young folks. When you get to <laughs> like your 30s, you do a whole lot of that, right? But um, yeah, my advice is, is to always start from the point of truth and honesty and self-awareness. And you'd be surprised mm -hmm. what you can get accomplished just by digging into those things. I mean, if you know you come from a racist background or if you come from where 
race was talking about a certain way, be honest about what those conversations were and what they taught you and ask yourself, mm -hmm. is this the kind of person that you really want to be? Yeah, you know, I feel like there's a 21st century mindset and a 21st century skill set that, um, you know, everybody's going to need uh, a, a, a mindset of empathy. I mean, we got, we're going to be dealing with, you know, people, every color, flavor, every kind of human being ever born. We all have to deal with each other now um, because of the internet, because of just the world economy. You're going to be competing against people in China and, and, and uh, Nigeria. That's just the world. So you have to have a mindset of empathy to really try to understand where people are coming from. You have to have a skill set of listening. If you understand this conversation, you can talk to black folk and brown folk and Muslims, everybody else. So we're trying to confer a benefit to you. <laughs> we're trying to make you better. It'll make my life better, but it'll make your life better too. Now, um, what charity are you supporting? Well, you, as you, as some people can maybe see my t-shirt, it says support black journalists, right? The lack of still black journalists in most um, newsrooms is, is pretty appalling. What changed my life and what got me uh, really on the right path in this business was being a, a member of the National Association of Black Journalists. NABJ is the largest minority journalism organization in the country. The development, the networking, job fair, internships, scholarships, what happens there has changed lives. You know, it changed a lot of people's careers. I mean, people like you, Van, and uh, everybody you want to think of, Roland Martin, Soledad O'Brien, it's uh, just a number of people, uh, Michael Wilbon, that are a part of this organization and have been able to build legacies there. And so uh, it's on us to, again, usher in this next generation of young journalists who, I get it right now, feeling really discouraged when they look at um, not just what a lot of newsrooms look like, a lot of networks look like, but, you know, also we're under the, um, you know, under the shadow of a pandemic right now. So you, uh, there's a lot of journalists who have lost their jobs. A lot of companies are downsizing. They need a reason to believe and to be in this business. And so NABJ has done so much for my career and continues to do that uh, for others. So that's the charity that I support and the organization that has changed my life and that of many others. Well, listen, I, I, uh, I second that, third that, and fourth that. Uh, NABJ is a beautiful organization. Um, I've, I've got uh, groups I want to support as well. But what I want to say to you is just thank you, thank you, thank you for your light, for your leadership, for your courage, um, for your entrepreneurship, for your t-shirts and all that type of stuff. Um, make sure to support, support the sister businesses uh, and, yeah. and let's keep, keep this conversation going. Uh, much, much love to you. Thank you, Van. This is a pleasure. I got good news for you. I got bad news for you. The good news is that people are activating all around the world, all across the planet for change. That is a powerful moment. Here's the bad news. Unfortunately, this is not a one answer fixes everything situation. We're talking about systemic problems, which means it's not just one law or one person. You need 360 degrees of change to shift to get the outcome that's right. Um, but we can get there if we keep talking, if we keep working, if we keep building. And if we do that, we can reshape America. That can be done. It's been done in the past. Uh, we, we, we can move the whole world in a better direction. So I hope that your cell phone right now is full of screenshots uh, of these tools that we've been trying to give you to continue taking action uh, from this virtual town hall. When the stream ends, the conversation should not end. We got to keep pushing. We got to keep going. We are in an important moment in history. And what you do is going to determine the outcome. 2020 is going to be talked about for 20 years, 100 years, maybe 1,000 years. But the future is not written. It's up to what you and I do and what you and I decide is going to happen. So I want to give a special thanks to the powerful voices that we've had, Elaine Welteroth, Killer Mike, Jamel Hill. Make sure you visit 50percentpledge.org to learn more about the power of money. Also visit my organization, reformalliance.com. We're trying to make a change. Let's be about it, not just talk about it. I'm Van Jones.